Oh, hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Paul Duran, and uh, as Maxine says, I'm a, a principal engineer in EC2. Uh, I'm based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, welcome to this tech talk on Nitro system support for previous generation instances. That's a bit of a mouthful, but you'll get the idea of what this means as I go through the talk. Now, these slides are actually from Chalk Talks that my colleague Kuba Dumanovsky, who's a technical program manager, and myself, gave at reInvent in Las Vegas at the end of last year. I know that some of you in the audience are very familiar with the technology I'm going to discuss here, and I apologize in advance if that some of what I say is overly simplistic. I hope that you'll find the majority of the material interesting, and we can go deeper in the Q&A at the end of the talk. Now at AWS, we strive to be the most customer obsessed company in the world. 90% of what we do is driven directly by what customers tell us matters to them. And the other 10% are things we hear from customers where they may not be able to articulate exactly what they want, but we try to read between the lines. Now this whole project came about because some of our long-term customers told us that they were concerned about the business continuity of their older workloads. And especially in the context of the growing number of retirement announcements, announcements by some cloud providers in recent years. Well, we listened and here's what we've done. But first, a little history. On August 25th, 2006, we started the public beta of our first ever EC2 instance. Back then, it didn't even have a name, but we dubbed it M1 Small later on. A little terminology. In general, M and T instances are general purpose, C are compute optimized, R are memory optimized, and I and D are storage optimized. So M1 Small is a small general purpose instance. It provides the equivalent of a 1.7 gig Xeon processor with 1.75 gigs of RAM, 160 gigs of local disk, and 250, 250 megabits per second of network bandwidth. It was all delivered to our first customers at just 10 cents an hour, on demand, whenever, and for as long as they needed it. Amazon EC2 instances are booted from AMIs or Amazon machine images. Each AMI is a pre-configured disk image, a packaged up operating system, with all the user space components and drivers pre-installed. Initially, these armies were stored as an S3 object and hydrated to a local disk on the host during launch. And later, with the introduction of Amazon Elastic Block Storage, EBS, we added the option to store and boot VMs directly from EBS volumes. And under the hood of all these instances was the Zen hypervisor. Initially, the CPUs had no hardware virtualization support, so instances were para-virtualized. In other words, the kernels in those armies I mentioned was built to understand that it was being virtualized and to cooperate with the hypervisor. IO was provided by para-virtualized or PV devices, which as we'll learn later on are purely software constructs using a split driver model and running entirely on the host CPU. No special hardware offload back then. Now, 15 years have passed since we launched M1 Small. And throughout those years, we have launched 27 instance types built on Zen in four generations. And today, we have millions of active customers running tens of millions of Zen-based instances. Now, during that time, the CPU vendors didn't stand still. Newer and more capable CPUs were brought to market. And one of those capabilities was hardware virtualization extensions, familiar to some of you as Intel's VMX or AMD's SVM. So of course, our new Zen instances made use of those hardware virtualization extensions to avoid the need for PV kernels. But what about those PV devices? They work okay, but we wanted to give our customers better performance. And if we stuck with PV devices, which remember are purely software, that would mean burning more CPU cycles in the backend. CPU that we really want to be giving directly to our customers to run their workloads. So we started thinking about new architectures where we move as much of the IO processing as possible off the host DPUs and into dedicated hardware. And the aim was to increase both performance and security because that offloaded hardware would be dedicated to a VM for its lifetime and not shared between multiple VMs. In 2013, we took the first step, launching C3 instances with enhanced networking, dedicating Intel 82599 PCI functions to VMs to provide direct network access. Using DMA, network packets could be moved directly to or from guest memory and avoid interrupts and context switches. Then in 2014, with the C4 instances, we did something similar for block storage by moving EBS, the EBS data path into dedicated hardware. And then in 2016, with the X1 instances, we started to provide our own networking hardware with the introduction of the Elastic Network Adapter, or ENA. Always, our ultimate goal 
has been to give all available CPU cores to customers. So we kept asking ourselves, can we do better? Well, all our efforts eventually led to the Nitro system. This was launched at reInvent in 2017. And while that was the first time we talked publicly about Nitro, it was a journey that started with those C3 instances back in 2013. As you saw, we kept introducing various elements of the Nitro system, like the EBS and ENA hardware, into EC2 instances over the years. And since 2017, all the new instances we have introduced run on top of the complete Nitro system, a system with even more purpose-built hardware and new software to free up even more of those CPU cycles for our customers. The core of this new software was our purpose-built Nitro hypervisor, a partitioning hypervisor with the aim of minimizing overhead as much as possible. The heavyweight operations of virtual machine administration, i.e. what's commonly referred to as the hypervisor tool stack, are also offloaded to dedicated hardware in the Nitro system, freeing up many more host CPU cycles than we could achieve with the Zen hypervisor and its tool stack. But when we talk with customers about EC2 and our roadmap, they would often say, OK, this is all great. Your latest instances have all the bells and whistles from the dedicated Nitro cards and the Nitro hypervisor. What about all of those previous generation instances that launched before the introduction of the complete Nitro system? Many of our customers have built their applications on top of, for example, C3 or even M1. And those applications have been running fine for many years now. Many of those customers don't have the time, resources, or perhaps even the expertise to redo everything and port their workload to a new instance that's running on the Nitro system. At the same time, customers understand that those previous generation instances, the Zen instances, are hosted on physical hardware running in physical AWS data centers, and that hardware has a finite lifetime. This has also been a concern for us for a while now. With Zen instances using older generation hardware, and the OEMs reducing the production of gen previous generation chipsets and components to focus on new technology, it's becoming increasingly challenging to offer the same elasticity, scalability, and availability that customers expect from EC2. Furthermore, customers have communicated increasing concerns about the longevity of infrastructure products and services due to deprecation announcements from other cloud providers. AWS is in a unique position due to our size and 15 years of history. Today, we have millions of customers still running tens of millions of Zen-based instances, and these customers value the stability and consistency that EC2 provides to them, and especially the ability to run their workloads on the instance they were originally born on. So we asked ourselves, can we take those Zen instances and run them on the Nitro system? Well, as you probably guessed, the answer is yes. We've announced that AWS, the AWS Nitro system will support pre the previous generation of general purpose, compute optimized, storage optimized, and memory optimized instances. We will not, however, be running previous generations of accelerated instances on the Nitro system. We worked with customers and learned that they run highly optimized and highly customized workloads for specific accelerators, for instance, GPUs. So the only way to provide compatibility under the Nitro system would be to emulate those specific accelerators. And that kind of defeats the point of an accelerator. Also, because customers are, those customers are often rebuilding their workloads to take advantage of the latest hardware, they are the most able and the most willing to move to the latest Nitro instances. So coming back to non-accelerated instances, what does that mean that they, will be, that they will be supported on the Nitro system? Well, it means we provide the customers with the ability to continue to run their Zen-based instances for years to come without worrying about the lifetime of the underlying hardware. As the hardware in which those instances were originally launched on reaches the end of its life, we will move the instances onto the newer Nitro hardware. But how are we going to maintain the environment that older hardware provided? Well, now I'll go into some of the detail. I'm going to take you through some of the fundamentals of how new instances run in the Nitro system, some background on how previous generation instances run in the Zen system, and then we can how we can take those previous generation of instances and bring them into the Nitro system without the need for the customer to make any changes. So first, let's take a look at running new or native Nitro instances. Well, here we see the representation of an EC2 instance. It's running an operating system, some form of workload, but the bit I want to focus on is the access to the networking and storage. Under the Nitro system, storage and network access is provided to the by custom hardware called the Nitro card. Actually, there's multiple Nitro cards, but for simplicity, we'll just think there's one here. 
Then there's a hypervisor, which is made up of two components. There's KVM, the kernel module, labeled one here, that provides convenient access to the x86 hardware virtualization extensions. And then there's the VMM, virtual machine monitor, labeled two, which is responsible for managing the virtual in machine instance during its lifetime. This includes things like handling of emulation of core hardware, such as interrupt controllers and timers. Now in the Nitro system, to get the best performance for the customer, we want the shortest path between the Nitro card and the instance. The Nitro card supports a technology known as PCI virtual functions and is provisioned with elastic network adapter virtual functions to provide network access and NVMe virtual functions to provide storage, one enough for each instance. The VMM can then use KVM to make these virtual functions available to the instance using a technique known as pass-through. So effectively, the operating system in the instance is talking straight to the Nitro card and hence getting direct access to the storage and network. Now let's take a look at the Zen hypervisor, which is the current environment for those previous generation instances. Here we see our representation of an EC2 instance again. But this time it's running on Zen, as we can see. This is older hardware, so there's no custom Nitro card. And access to storage and network on the host is made available using paravirtual devices, or PV devices for short. Now, what are PV devices? PV devices are purely software constructs, constructs that use a split driver model. The instance contains what is known as a front end driver, labeled one here, and the back end driver, labeled two, runs in the privileged DOM0 VM that actually has access to the underlying host storage and networking hardware. Data is then passed between the front end and back end using a shared memory buffer and a protocol to control access. Thus, the back end acts as a proxy for the front end's interactions with the underlying storage and network. But how does the instance know what PV devices are available? There's no pass through hardware. As I said, PV devices are purely software construct. Well, an instance discovers what PV backends it can talk to by using an API called ZenStore. And this actually uses another shared memory buffer and PV protocol to talk to a service running in DOM0. This is a key value store that lists all the PV backends for an instance. And hence the instance can start up all the front ends it needs to talk to those backends. But how does the instance even know it's running on Zen? We should go and look for the PV devices in the first place. Well, it uses a special instruction, the x86 CPU ID instruction, labeled one. This instruction is commonly used by OS to probe the hardware on which they're running. In a VM though, this instruction causes a trap into the hypervisor known as a VM exit, labeled two. This means the hypervisor determines the nature of the virtual hardware seen by the OS. It can hide features, but it can also provide extra ones. And one of these extra features is a hypervisor signature. The OS issues the CPU ID instruction with the EAX register set to four and seven zeros. And then Zen passes back the ASCII string Zen VMM, Zen VMM in registers EVX, ECX, and EDX. So that's how the OS knows it's running inside a Zen virtual machine. So back to those memory buffers shared between guest and DOM0, labeled one. How are they set up? They're set up using an API in Zen called the grant table API, labeled two here. But how does the guest access this API? Well, there are another couple of special x86 instructions, RDMSR and WRMSR, labeled one here. They're also instructions that the OS uses when probing and configuring hardware. MSR stands for Model Specific Register. RDMSR is used to read from one, and WRMSR is used to write to one. And these also cause that VM exit trap, labeled two, and thus the hypervisor can hide or extend the feature set, just like it does with the CPU ID instruction. But notice WRMSR. RMSR is used to write information. So pretty much the first thing does, first, first thing an OS does when it discovers it's running inside a Zen VM is write a special MSR with the address of a page of its own memory. And that page labeled two here is then filled in by Zen with what are known as hypercall stubs. These stubs are sequences of instructions that can be used to make hypercalls. Hypercall is how the guest accesses the ground table API. Think of hypercalls is the hypervisor equivalent of system calls in an OS. 
Just like when an application wants to, for instance, open a file, it makes a system call to the OS to perform that operation. So when an OS knows that it's running inside a Zen VM and wants to set up some shared memory, it can make a hyper call to do it. Now back to the front ends and back ends. There's more to passing data than setting up a shared memory buffer. There needs to be some way to control copying of data into and out of that buffer. The front end needs to be able to tell the back end when there's data to process. And equally, the back end needs to be able to tell the front end when it's finished processing that data. So how does that happen? Well, it happens using another hypercore API labeled two. This one's called the event channel API, and it's like an interrupt mechanism that allows the front end and back end to signal each other. And that completes our picture of the core of the environment that Zen provides for storage and networking access using PV devices. So now let's take a look how we go about running these previous generation instances on the Nitro system. We have our Zen instances in the Zen instance, sorry, in the top right there. And as we saw in the Zen host, to make that PV front end in the instance work, we need to provide these things framed in the ellipse. The PV backends labeled one to act as proxies for the front ends. A key value store labeled two for the Zen store API so the instance can find the backends. And the grant table and event channel APIs labeled three so that the front ends and backends can talk to each other. So what's going to provide those things in the Nitro system? Well, the answer is the VMM. As I said before, the VMM is already responsible for emulating core hardware, such as interrupt controllers and timers. So we can also have it handle the other things that we need for those Zen instances to run. We do also have to make some modifications to KVM though. Remember how the OS uses the CPUID instruction to discover it's running on Zen? Well, we have to set up CPUID information in KVM to make it look like the hypervisor is actually Zen. And we have to set up that hypercall table so that we can route hypercalls through to the right APIs in the VMM. But how do the PV backends in the VMM access the storage and networking virtual functions on the Nitro card? Well, remember that the VMM has access to those virtual functions. In the case of native Nitro instances, we just pass them through. For Zen instances, though, we can simply run drivers for the ENA and NVMe virtual functions using VFIO in the VMM rather than have the drivers run in the guest. The new PV backends in the VMM therefore have direct access to the storage and networking for the instance and can act as proxies for the front ends just like the original PV backends did running in DOM0 on the Zen host. And that's how we run Zen instances in the Nitro system. So what comes next for customers? Well, nothing really. As we've seen, there's no change necessary to the guest OS or drivers in the AMI. It all happens transparently. Some of the largest AWS and Amazon services that were born on Zen are already successfully running on top of Nitro. And starting in Q1 of 2022, i.e. any time now, we're rolling this out to our customers. We're starting with the oldest Zen instances, C1, M1, M2, C3, M3, R3, T2, sorry, T1, and I2. We plan to move all of these instances to the Nitro system in 2022. Initially, we'll enable newly launched instances and instances that are part of auto scaling groups to land on Nitro. After that, existing instances will be migrated throughout the year. Customers will receive a standard maintenance notification, same as they do today for any other maintenance event. Migrations will be transparent. They happen just with a reboot. All the data from both the EBS volumes and the local instance store get migrated. Instance characteristics are not changed, but you may see a slight increase in performance in some use cases. And after 2022, we will gradually extend the support to other Zen instances. So eventually all EC2 instances will be running on top of the Nitro system. But we're not stopping there. Just as the original hardware running those Zen instances is reaching the end of its life right now, the first Nitro system hardware will eventually reach the end of its life. So we'll take the knowledge we have gained in this project and we'll apply it to Nitro instances too. This means that workloads customers have built on top of, for example, a C5 or an M5 will continue to run beyond the lifetime of the underlying hardware. Customers will never have to worry about business continuity for their EC2 workloads. And with that message, let's move to Q&A.